infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And on today's show, we're going to take a look at Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, a virus my guest today calls the red-headed stepchild of the herpes family of viruses. Joining me to take a look at this herpes virus is infectious disease physician Stephen LaRosa, MD. Dr. LaRosa, welcome to the show, sir. Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me back. Yes, sir. Now, before we get into some of the specifics of EBV, uh, can you give an overview for the audience on the herpes virus family? Because it's really more than HSV. Right. So there is uh, HSV-1, which typically causes uh, cold sores, people are probably familiar with. HSV-2, which tends to be the cause of genital herpes. There's varicella zoster virus, VZV, which is the cause of chicken pox in, in usually in young people and then reactivation of that virus in adulthood, usually in the elderly, that causes zoster, commonly called shingles. Uh, there is a CMV, cytomegalovirus, which is usually a cause of fever and, a mon and mononucleosis in young people. Uh, there are, is HHV6, which causes rubiola in, in, in children and can reactivate and transplant patients and cause viremia. And um, there's then there's uh, Epstein-Barr virus, which most people probably know is the major cause of infectious mononucleosis in uh, early adulthood, leading to prolonged uh, fever, uh, swollen lymph nodes, uh, enlarged liver and spleen and can uh, make people pretty miserable for a number of months. Right. And this is a really, really common virus. I mean, most people are infected with it at some point during their life. Yeah, I, up to 90% 90, 90 of people have usually been infected with uh, Epstein-Barr virus at some point. Again, usually uh, uh, it tends to be the earlier in life that you get the symptoms, the less severe they are if you get them. Uh, late adulthood um, uh, or early, you know, mid to late adulthood, it tend, the symptoms tend to be more severe. But when you, if you go about testing people, you'll find about 90% of people would have had it during their lifetime. Right. And as you mentioned, it's frequently linked to infectious mononucleosis. Can you talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms of mononucleosis? Sure. So again, a, a, a typical patient will be uh, somebody who's in high school or, or college. It's the so-called kissing disease. It's associated with saliva and deep kissing. And following a uh, incubation period, there's uh, it's characterized by high fevers, uh, swollen lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy, uh, and exudative pharyngitis. So swollen tonsils would exudate. Usually uh, elevation in, uh, of the uh, liver transaminases, so hepatic inflammation, and also very enlarged and tender uh, spleens. Uh, and these symptoms can go on for a number of days. And on average, peop, uh, young adults uh, in the prime of their lives will miss an average of 20 days of school or work or, or, or military service through the military. So it's a, it's it's not a common cause of mortality, but a, it's a source of significant morbidity. Right. Um, and how about the the treatment? Is is are there antivirals for this, or is it just something that has to run its course? Well, there, the, that's kind of one of the issues uh, is we don't have a lot of lot to offer these uh, young people who are <laughs> suffering. Uh, uh, acyclovir and valacyclovir are not very active uh, against uh, uh, the virus. Um, there's been a few clinical trials that. Uh, would suggest some slight improvements in, in clinical recovery and some decrease in viral shedding, but the problem has been uh, with those currently available agents that as soon as the agent is stopped, there's a rebound uh, viremia. So currently, there's nothing 
uh, uh, proved that uh, uh, has been demonstrated to shorten um, clinical symptoms and time to recovery. And if somebody has EBV, whether in the form of infectious mononucleosis or, or some other type of syndrome, um, after the syndrome or illness is over, is the virus gone? Oh, it can persist for a, a number of months, both in the oral secretions uh, as well as in the bloodstream. So um, people are uh, contagious. You, you tell them not to try to avoid uh, uh, kissing, sharing utensils, toothbrushes, et cetera. So it, it does persist for uh, a number of months. There is no um, – there used to be a time where uh, – uh, people would espouse the notion of chronic uh, mononucleosis, but that uh, is an extremely rare uh, phenomenon and does not uh, occur in immunocompetent adults. So it's not something that uh, people, what we usually tell people in the absence of any treatment is they're probably going to feel pretty poorly for a few months and it's going to take them a number of months of convalescence um, until they get back to their baseline, but they will they will go back to their previous state of well-being. Okay, but, but does the virus go dormant like other herpes viruses? Yes, so it, it, it does go dormant, which uh, raises the possibility of uh, being involved in a number of uh, um, non and tra traditionally non-infectious illnesses. So I don't know if you want to talk about those now yeah, um, I, no, or I, had other questions. Well, I'm actually heading into it, and at this point, I, I can introduce your blog. It's My Thoughts on the Future of Infectious Disease and Medicine, and that's at drlarosa.blogspot.com. And on his blog, he does write about this. And um, Dr. LaRosa, can you spend a moment discussing the link between EBV and MS? multiple sclerosis. Right. So multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease with plaques that causes both cognitive and uh, physical uh, symptoms. Um, there have been studies that have looked at brain biopsies and brain samples from, from MS, uh, patients with MS. And uh, again, there are association studies until uh, there's been nothing that absolutely proves uh, causality. But a number of groups, uh, including groups uh, from Stanford uh, and also in Saudi Arabia, have looked at brain biopsies, and they have found um, EBV uh, not only in the B cells uh, in the brain, that tends to be where it's dormant, uh, but also in astrocytes and microglia. And it, it tends to be uh, in the um, latent stage, so EBV, you know, persists in either one or two stages. There's a latent stage where there's not active re replication. Then there's a lytic stage where there's uh, um, active replication. And they've, multiple groups have now found EBV in the, in the latent stage in the brain. And there's been some very small trials of using uh, either acyclovir or valacyclovir in patients. And uh, nothing definitively but there, uh, has been found, but there's a trend towards uh, improved improvement in the patients who have the most active form of the disease. So I really think that this is a, uh, an area ripe for further uh, study. Um, again, all we have is uh, association studies, but uh, to prove causality, you'd have to prove that you treating, treating the organism would actually make a difference. Right, right. And how, how about uh, the, the association between EBV and autoimmune disease? Right, so there, uh, it's interesting. There's a number of studies that have uh, suggested an association with autoimmune diseases. There's one, there was one particular study in Filipino uh, patients with uh, uh, lupus, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, and in those patients, uh, antibodies to uh, early antigen antibodies and Epstein-Barr virus correlated with the presence of, presence of having uh, lupus uh, antibodies and uh, also in another study, a presence with the um, anti-Rho and anti-La antibodies have been observed in, in Sjogren's uh, syndrome, another autoimmune disease. And there were actually uh, also increased levels of EBV DNA found in, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So, again, lots of association uh, studies, but uh, uh, no... Um, 
uh, no clear causality. One of the one of the challenges has been having an agent that has uh, uh, activity against um, EBV, and there is an investigational agent called Val Omacyclovir that actually has a six-fold increase in potency against EBV compared to acyclovir and uh, uh, Val acyclovir. And it would be nice to, uh, you know, see studies in some of these indications with an agent that actually has uh, significant activity against this organism. Yeah. Um, so with all this information, um, it's a, it seems like a rather important virus. But I want to go back to the introduction. Um, Dr. LaRosa, why do you consider EBV the red-headed stepchild of the herpes virus family? Because uh, it, it, it just doesn't get the uh, attention uh, that, for instance, zoster gets. Uh, shingles, uh, you know, uh, or reactivated varicella causes you know, significant pain uh, in elderly patients and a, a lot of attention. Obviously, chickenpox in kids, which hopefully is a thing of the past with the varicella vaccine. A CMV gets a, a, a lot of attention, particularly in, in transplant patients and immunocompromised patients. But EBV, which causes so many cases, I think it's 1.5 million cases in the U.S. Uh, a year, uh, essentially gets no attention because we don't have anything we can do. And you, you sit there with the patients and say, uh, well, you know, rest and take care of yourself and it will resolve on its own. And, and so it, it's like EBV has really become an afterthought because we can't do anything about it. And so we just tend to ignore it. So that's why I call it the red-haired stepchild of the RPs family. Yeah, very interesting. And again, if you want to check out his article, it's very, very good. You can find that at My Thoughts on the Future of Infectious Disease and Medicine. That's at drlarosa.blogspot.com. Dr. Stephen LaRosa, thank you, sir, once again for your time and your expertise. I appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. You bet. If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com or email at info at glymedx.com.